Welcome to How Gear Changed the Game, a curious exploration of the evolution of sports brought about by the change and evolution of the gear we use to play the game. We've been exploring the evolution of football, brought about by the changes in the types of football helmets, the types of materials used, and the way that they get used within the game. If you haven't yet, there are three other episodes waiting for you before this one, and everything kind of builds on top of one another, so if you haven't checked out Genesis, Tonight in the T, and the World War II and Oklahoma drill, you should do that now, because again, we're building upon information we've already gathered. In those earlier episodes, we talked about how rule changes brought about a different type of contact, which brought about the need for different types of protection. How the protection has changed over the years and how changes in the type of gear we use has enabled different types of strategies to emerge and succeed in the game. For instance, the T formation, utilized by big, strong, talented, and quick players, but the T formation becoming the go-to strategy across the board at all levels of football may have been helped along by the introduction of the plastic helmet and harder padding, because not every player at all levels, college, pro, and high school, are as big, quick, and talented as the Chicago Bears of the 1940s. We learned about how the plastic helmet was utilized for World War II, and then after the war, how the plastic helmet played a substantial role in the emergence of a drill now used in just about every training camp, the Oklahoma drill. And when we left off last episode, the plastic helmet was just starting to take hold in the football equipment world. And as it becomes more common, well, the way that players tackle and block starts to change. And we're going to talk about that change here in the early part of this episode because it creates this context and a need for more protection around the head. We're about to dive into an interesting story about the face mask in football. They're common today, but it almost didn't happen. There were critics, concerns, as well as proponents, as well as players finding new ways to utilize this face mask in more than one way. But where did the face mask of this era come from? Who was against it? Who was for it? And who put it to best use? And how did that have an effect on the game? Well, that's what we're going to dive into. I'm Alex Kindig Sherman, and I'm about to tell you the story of the face mask and how that piece of gear changed the game. When we left off last episode, the plastic helmet had arrived and was really starting to catch on. But what's interesting is how quickly things changed in a span of just 10 years. In 1939, the same year the plastic helmet was invented and brought to the market, well, that was the same year that helmets were even made mandatory to college level. So we go from helmets being completely optional, but still leather, to Everybody having to wear a helmet at the college level, pros, still whatever you want to do, to people maybe opting to try this new plastic helmet, to suddenly everybody using the plastic helmet. That's 10 years going from players maybe not even wearing a helmet at all, to everyone wearing a helmet, to everyone wearing a much harder, much robust, much more protective plastic helmet. And we've learned last episode that the game was going through changes elsewhere. Maybe it was strategy, rule changes, media coverage, a world war. But the game was changing, and when there's a change in the type of equipment on the field, players slightly change the way they play. Or, as I've already reiterated in this episode, the T-formation was a type of play that was very demanding, very risky, and required more protection that the plastic helmet conveniently started to offer. But with this plastic helmet becoming commonplace after 10 years of rapid change, well, it's now a baseline condition of the ecosystem of football. More protection is a good thing. More widespread use of advanced ways of protecting yourself is also a good thing. But let's revisit that definition of compensatory behavior. We've talked about it in the past couple episodes, and I won't read the definition again because you should have heard it in the previous episodes, but basically you outsource your risk and your dangers to the equipment that you wear. So if you're driving down the road in a small teeny tiny car, you're going to drive a little bit more cautious in dangerous conditions than you would in a much larger, much more protective vehicle. Or 
if you're going to ram your head into a wall, you're not going to ram it as hard into that wall as you would if you were wearing a big old protective plastic helmet. The introduction of plastic helmets is commonplace among the equipment that players wear changes the way that players block and tackle. And that's evident with using things like the T formation. On the 1940s Stanford team, for example, one of the big ways they made that T formation work at the line of scrimmage was brush blocking. It wasn't just about blocking a guy, putting a shoulder into him, but actually exploding with your head forward at them and then launching upward. This obscured their view so they couldn't see where the ball carrier was. They couldn't see what the quarterback was doing because they were so preoccupied with this beast of a blocker giving them a hard time. And it's not a bad tactic. You shoot forward, then shoot upward, and that kind of removes them from that low center of gravity. You can knock them off balance as well as obscuring their vision and making it harder for them to do their job. But the thing becoming commonplace here is the use of the head. You now have a plastic helmet that is protecting you from these hard blows to the head, which means you can do more with your head and worry less about injury. Bottom line is the introduction of the plastic helmet changes the game of football because it changes a lot of variables within the game, a lot of pieces that come together to make the baseline condition of football. And the plastic helmet was designed with a specific baseline condition of the game in mind and was intended to protect players against that baseline condition. And that baseline condition was single wing formations, leather helmets, and those types of collisions. And it did a good job of being economical and of preventing skull fractures with that harder top. But as players got their hands on this thing, they really started to understand the power that that helmet can provide. In some cases, it allowed players to gain an advantage. In some cases, it allowed players to have an equalizer. And just as quickly as plastic helmets started to roll out and not every team had them, criticism started to pop up. Concerns started to pop up, and even rules committees in certain states were worried about the effect that plastic helmets were having on the game. One of those cases is in Wisconsin. This coming from the Green Bay Press-Gazette on October 18, 1947. The article headlined, More Protection for High School Athletes Being Planned Now. It's talking about some of the rules that the Wisconsin Interscholastic Athletic Association was going to be talking about. And one of them was about the materials going into, quote, modern athletic equipment. And the last item in the article talked about, quote, The committee pointed out that materials going into modern athletic equipment, particularly football gear, give added protection to the wearer, but often inflict serious injury on the opposing player. An example cited by the committee was the new plastic football helmet. Old-style leather helmets had a certain amount of give, the committee said, but the newer plastic helmet is a, quote, regular battering ram, end quote, and end quote. So the way that players started to use this helmet, it wasn't just for protection at some point. Sometimes players were using it as a battering ram. And again, compensatory behavior. They're not as worried about themselves getting hurt while making these riskier plays with this new, strong, robust plastic helmet. And there was concerns popping up all across the country with these things. And there were some school districts and some high school football rules committees in some states that were even saying, maybe we should outlaw these plastic helmets. But the players, individually, some of them, not all of them right away, were figuring out how to use this plastic helmet for power, for an advantage, or for an equalizer when they're outmatched when it comes to size. And it wasn't just players that were outmatched because of size. Bigger players were using the helmet in certain ways, too. Either way, the plastic helmet was causing a change in the way that players block and tackle. They were starting to utilize them as an advantage. Many players were starting to use butt blocks, frowned upon, considered unsportsmanlike, but not exactly illegal. In every sport, there are cases where lots of players are doing something that toes the line of what's illegal and unsportsmanlike. Bull blocks, brush blocks, and butt blocks fall into that gray area. Considered an unsportsmanlike penalty, but not clearly defined, and rarely, if ever, called. And in looking at game footage from 1940s, it's clear that once players get a plastic helmet, they start using their head for contact in ways they hadn't done before. It's apparent as early as 1940 in footage from the first team to use plastic helmets, Northwestern. Players aren't just using these plastic helmets as protection, they're using it to punish their opponents. I had a conversation with author Matt Cheney about the effects of plastic helmets and face masks in the evolution of the game. 
He's done a lot of research and writing when it comes to the health and legal ramifications of football, and he is a wealth of knowledge. I recommend checking some of it out. It's at fourwallspublishing.com. We had a talk about this change in the type of contact that takes place in the 1950s, but first, I had to ask him about the origin of that term, butt block. It's a weird term, right? You know, they're using the head, but we're referring to the butt. Are we talking about people's butts? What are we talking about here? Was somebody who was first doing a butt block so ugly that people confused his butt for his face? Well, let's get to the bottom of that first. Well, it's it. the butt goes back to the terms of the 1870s. It comes out of English rugby rules. No butting. Anti-butting was a rule of the post-Civil War English and American sport complex. It was against the rules in boxing and prize fighting. It was against the rules in rugby and against the rules of football or soccer, as we know it or call it today. So um, by 1883, we have Walter Camp basically in charge, writing the initial rules, creating the line of scrimmage, creating the three downs and a first down rule, only one team with a possession at a time, so on and so forth. And the initial rule said no butting uh, is allowed. This, this was transferred from the rugby rules. Well, very quickly, they realized that's impossible in this forward lining, forward colliding game. There's going to be a heck of a lot of butting. Uh, it was obvious in a br- smashed noses and broken teeth everywhere. But what it's was the, butting? Was it just like the it, launching? Butting is using the head to strike your opponent. And they meant anywhere. They they meant no. You were not to use. You were to use the rugby tackle with the shoulder. See, rugby rules forbid you butting anyone anywhere. You don't butt them in the shoulder. You're not supposed to butt them in the chest or the face. But it's if it's sh- the head, then why are they calling it the butt? But that is the term of of head butts. Butting ah. is butting is a ramming definition way back, of course, in nature. And in the sports, it was into a, it was in rules before American football. And American football absorbed the anti-budding rule, very quickly realized they could not do anything about that. They tried, but by 1889, it's getting them in trouble already because they are not enforcing, just like today, people have to hit the way they hit. So this was a troublesome thing. For the first round of American football, by the end of the 1880s, there were I've got the articles. Crowds were raised, and and by rules, you were supposed to be ejected. Duh, does that sound familiar? <laughs> You're supposed to be ejected. Well, they're trying to eject a player or two, and they're almost getting referees killed. Seriously, there was a game at Swarthmore in Pennsylvania or something. These guys were lucky to get out of there with their lives because they disqualified someone by following the anti budding rule, 1888 or something. So. Here, what does Walter Camp do? He just kind of erases it from the old rule book, and he takes out the budding. Budding is out. It goes to unsportsmanlike conduct, personal file. (laughs) So there you go. Okay, glad we learned that nice little bit of information. Now, in the days of leather helmets or no helmets, budding came at a physical risk and cost to those trying to deliver it. But once the plastic helmet comes along, well players start to figure out real quick that it can do a whole lot more than anything else. Well, there was a very injurious technique that resulted. I can't find it till the late forties and I'm sure. And I, but you've seen films that I have not. And uh, it may be even in that nine plastic helmets. And even when they went up against other, put the forehead, the, the plastic covered forehead right into your teeth is what they wanted to do. And there was a master at this down at Baylor, a real skinny running back, Jerry Cootie, the preacher man, a really tough, quick, not fast running back for the Baylor football team uh, around 1950s when he started coming in. So at this transition, by 1947, Baylor is receiving Rydell plastic helmets. And began with a coach Woodruff, I began, I believe, it transferred into this coach George Sauer. So here is this guy, Cootie, who has to sit back there and wait for these giants basically to run in there and ram him. 
Cody is not built like your typical football player, even for the early 1950s. He's five foot 11, 165 pounds. Until he starts using his head, he doesn't have the equalizer. You know, some of these guys are 6'4", 220, 225, and he's getting ripped in the Southwest Conference trying to block for the quarterback in particular. He starts perfecting this little, almost like a little bat wing launch up into people. He gets his arms to the side and just coils down like a frog and springs up in, again, no face masks but these extremely hard plastic shells that cover the forehead around to the ears and back. So he is ramming guys with his cut plastic covered forehead uh, in their head. They are laying each other out in these plastic helmets with no face masks. There are some serious hits going on out there. So Cootie takes out the all American tackle from Texas. I believe his name was Goss. And takes a tooth out of the guy, loosens up his upper dental frame, uh, gives him a serious neck injury. He's lucky he didn't kill him. He hit him with that with that forehead right in the mouth. And uh, the other guy's coming full speed. So that caused a lot of controversy. This is the 52 season. And it, go, it goes back and forth. You know, first, of course, Baylor plays the innocent. You know, well, we didn't, you know, this is, and it was a legal hit. It was not against the rules. Yep. And um, Texas was mad, of course, but uh, they knew what they were doing too. They weren't going to, they wanted plastic helmets. They didn't want to condemn these things. They, they filed no protests. And basically they were just going to bide their time and get revenge <laughs> as far <laughs> as I'm just presuming. Yeah. And so, it ended, you know, the controversy surrounding Baylor really peaked there at 52. Now, what was interesting, Jerry Cootie, the previous year, I believe it was in 51, or it was prior to the 52 season, he was in Look Magazine, the preach, the 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 crusher Cootie preacher man, you know, he's a ministerial student there at Baylor, and and he's already laying people out, and Look Magazine does a short little a uh, half page photo text profile thing on him. And he describes how he does his head. <laughs> huh. And so that really, I think got people looking for him in the 52 season. But right. people were shocked because it wasn't a football play. It wasn't in the spirit of football. So it basically came down to, you can't call it a penalty, but you can go, Hey, right. That is well, when, when you see blood and, and teeth, you know, which well, many people could see, uh, it is brutal. And then, of course, this really vicious head on the Texas player, you know, ignited the controversy. And see, he kind of stepped into the political frame there of the plastic helmet proponents versus the anti-plastic helmet. There were people that wanted the plastic. And what, in 1949, when the big NCAA official said, that's it, no more plastic helmets. And everybody said, what? Uh, that's not yeah. quite. Right. And so uh, we're, you know, plastic helmets were inevitable. And Jerry Cootie kind of lit the, the flame that pushed it farther and f- quicker to face masks, which within a few years were mandated. Yeah, there's no face masks yet. Well, they exist, but they're not commonplace. These guys are knocking hard plastic helmets into each other with no protection over their face. This becomes the new way of going about business on the gridiron. And so the form changes, the use of the head changes, and you can see that as evident not only in game footage from the time, but in simple things like Vince Lombardi's video series that was based off of his lectures, The Art and Science of Football. When he's teaching tackling, he says this, You aim the forehead straight at your opponent's chin, and then drive straight forward with the forehead directly into your opponent. At the moment the ball is snapped, you drive your head directly at your opponent's chin and move forward, striking with your forehead and moving your opponent off their center of gravity. Now, he does explain that you drive toward the chin because the defender will rise up, and so the blocker's forehead is actually going to end up hitting the numbers. But either way, now they're telling you to basically lead with your head. Make the hit with your forehead. 
Lombardi didn't implement or invent this style of blocking and tackling. He's simply teaching what has become commonplace. Ramming the top of your head straight forward into your opponent. Now, we talked about what butting was earlier, right? Remember that? So does this sound like butting to you? Look, that's been around in the game even before the plastic helmet, but the plastic helmet enabled players of all sizes and strengths to ram their heads into their opponent, play after play, snap after snap, with far less worry of an injury or any other type of repercussion that they would have if they were wearing a leather helmet or no helmet at all. But the same can't be said for the player on the receiving end. Yeah, you shouldn't butt your opponent, you shouldn't ram your head into an opponent, but when everybody's doing it, well, then it just becomes a common aspect of the game. So with bull blocks, brush blocks, and butt blocks becoming a common aspect of the game, no matter what critics go back and forth on, the main concern is protecting the players. And you can talk about rules, you can talk about banning helmets, but in the meantime, players are still getting hurt. Broken teeth, broken jaws, broken noses, broken orbital bones, or worse injuries than that. So while everybody debates, the most common, most simple solution is to give them some kind of facial protection. The face mask had been around in the game of football for quite some time, but thanks to the change in conditions of the game that we just talked about, the face mask was now going to become a common, essential part of the game of football. The origins and implementations of the face mask as we know it when we come back on How Gear Changed the Game. So with a new type of helmet introducing a new type of tackling and blocking, you know, things like bull blocks and butt blocks and guys driving their helmet and their forehead toward an opponent and up toward their chin, well, you can imagine, you know, the plastic helmet, it provides a lot of protection and allows players to make riskier plays. There's just one flaw. There's no protection in the face. And so that brings us to the face mask. Again, here's author Matt Cheney. You know, what's interesting, that is a fascinating era to me from the 1870s football helmet technology because it evolves, of course, from baseball's efforts for catchers and fencing. Those two sports had to create masks to protect people first, and they were successful early on. That was <laughs> That was the first death that began eliminating in baseball were catchers because they had something to reflect the the ball, a wire cage to reflect the ball by 1876. So these guys, uh, Harvard baseball takes over with it first. Actually, what became one of the first helmets in football in the 1880s began on the Harvard baseball team and transferred over to the football team. And it led to that rule I'm talking about of 1889 where they outlawed metal because <laughs> they were getting metal face masks out there. Then you go to the rubber mask of come, knock, bark, like several that uh, are is, is your evolution of first the helmet itself, but then later on the attachment, the modern you know post-war attachment. So the question is, who in this era was the first to invent a face mask to wear a face mask? I don't know. Google it. That's going to be the rest of this show. I'm just going to bring up a question and tell you to Google it, and then it's just going to be long pauses while I wait for you to look up the results. No, just kidding. That's why you're listening to this podcast. I'm doing the research for you. If you were to Google who invented the face mask, who was the first person to wear a face mask, a lot of the results are going to steer you toward the Cleveland Browns. Yeah, they did do something great in football. In the 1950s, Paul Brown was the coach, and they had a really great quarterback, a star named Otto Graham. And as the lore around the internet goes, Paul Brown invented the face mask because star quarterback Otto Graham 
got kicked in the face. The story goes like this. On November 15th of 1953, the San Francisco 49ers made their way to Cleveland to take on the Cleveland Browns, who at that time, going into that game, had a perfect 7-0 record. Over 80,000 people were at Cleveland Municipal Stadium that day, and during the first half of that game, the Browns are up by a score of 10 to nothing. Graham, during a play, is knocked out of bounds, and as he's knocked out of bounds, linebacker for the 49ers, Art Mahalik, or Michaelik, I don't know how exactly you pronounce it, so forgive me, throws an elbow toward Graham and strikes him in the face. And that opens up a nasty gash that requires who knows how many stitches. Some sources will cite the number of stitches as 18, some cite it as 26, some cite it as 34. Either way, the amount of stitches is divisible by 8. And there's pictures of it. It's pretty brutal. So that gash and that injury take Graham out of the game. Going into the half, the Browns are winning 10-7. to But this is a rival game, and there's a perfect record on the line. You need your star quarterback to be in this game. So this is the part of mythical legend. Some sources say that this is when Paul Brown's brain went to work. Some say that it was the trainer of the Browns that came up with this idea. Some say it was Graham himself who came up with this idea of fastening some sort of facial protection across the front of the helmet to protect this nasty gash that had just been stitched up for Graham so that he could go back in the game. Either way, most sources say that this was a makeshift design, that they just found something, fashioned it to the front, and then he could go right back in the game. And this thing that they fashioned to the helmet wasn't the face mask that you know it today. It was actually a piece of lucite, and lucite's a form of clear plastic, think like acrylic or plexiglass. It was about two inches wide, a quarter inch thick, and just went around the front of the face to protect the jawline and the mouth. Either way, now Otto Graham was protected. He could get back in the game, which is great news for a guy that can't feel his face and probably can't even see straight because he just got elbowed in the jaw so hard that he got split open. So with this lucite plastic face guard, Graham gets back in the game, helps his team get an additional 13 points, and thank goodness that he did because the 49ers put some points on the board as well. The final score, 23-21 to in favor of the Cleveland Browns. So the face mask helped the Browns gain a victory on this day. And then it entered the history books. I mean, it's right here. It's all over the internet. Otto Graham and Paul Brown invented the face mask in a pinch because of an injury. And so they are the inventors and the first wearers of the face mask. Except that's not true. Well, okay, the story about him getting elbowed and cut open is true. The story about putting a face mask on him to get him back in the game is also a true thing. But the concept of a face mask wasn't invented on the spot, and this lucite protection that just so happened to be perfectly shaped and had pre-drill holes perfectly ready to go on a helmet, well, that just sounds a little too convenient, doesn't it? And we know that nose guards already existed. We know about wired face masks. So this one's different because it's a lucite face mask, right? So maybe it's the first one of those kinds. Nope. There's actually a picture of a player for Northwestern in 1940 wearing a lucite face mask on their plastic helmet when they were one of the only teams in football to be wearing a plastic helmet. All right, so maybe Otto Graham was the first National Football League player to wear a face mask. Also, no. If you look through all sorts of pictures from back in the day before this year of 1953, you will see players wearing some sort of a face mask. Okay, so then why is this such a pivotal, legendary moment in the face mask lore? Well, number one, it's a great story, right? The guy gets split open, they put a face mask over his helmet so he can get back in the game, and he powers his team to a victory, and they preserve their perfect record and leave that game with a narrow victory and an 8-0 and record. Great, right? And during this era, sports writers and journalists weren't really privy to mentioning anything about new types of equipment in their articles. Trust me, I've been looking for a lot of stuff. And the thing is, I understand the use of lucite as a material for a face mask, but again, this is a type of plastic. It's a clear plastic, so the idea being that a player's vision wouldn't be obstructed by having a face mask, you know, in front of their face. But this stuff isn't exactly strong, and especially when you have big, strong guys with hard helmets running into one another, you can see how a piece of lucite plastic, that acrylic or plexiglass type stuff that's only a quarter inch thick and bowed around and tacked to a helmet could break pretty easily, right? Especially in very cold temperatures. Below freezing temperatures, stuff gets even more brittle. 
So the Lucite face mask would be around for a while, but it would eventually get banned. And by eventually, I think it was like a year or two later because they kept breaking and posing a risk to not only the people wearing it, who might end up with nasty gashes just like Otto Graham, but you could injure people on the other end of that face mask as well. So <laughs> the Lucite face mask came and went very quickly, even though it wasn't invented by Paul Brown or Otto Graham. It was already a piece of the inventory that the equipment manager had. Maybe they thought they invented it because nobody knew what that little piece of plastic was for, and they thought, huh, you know what? Why don't we just, uh, I don't know what this thing's for, but maybe if we put it on the front of the helmet, then that, that'll work as a face mask. And then the designer, who was either Riddell or Rawlings, said, yeah, that's why we gave it to you. Anyway, another reason this story probably gets circulated a lot is because it is the origin story of Paul Brown's patent. Yeah, this coach of the Cleveland Browns, his name is on a patent for a face mask. He'd been kicking around the idea for a while, but when your star quarterback gets knocked out of a game, you need facial protection, and maybe facial protection could have prevented this injury in the first place. That makes it a more pressing issue. So after this game and after the season concludes, Paul Brown starts having conversations with some technical consultants at the Riddell Company. And he's quoted as saying the following, quote, Give me something that will fit across the front of a helmet and will be about as big as my little finger with tensile strength. I want it so it can withstand a stray foot or a deliberately thrown fist or elbow and take away the inclination to punch someone. But keep it light enough to weigh less than an ounce. End quote. And so this patented design was a single bar that went around the front of the face, right about mouth level, that was coated in rubber. So this is the origin story, right? Of Paul Brown inventing the face mask. Not a lucite face mask, but a strong rubber-coated face mask. Except that's not true either. Yeah, his name is on a patent for a face guard. Credit where credit's due. He did go to Riddell, he did ask for this, he got his name on a patent, and then Riddell turned around and started selling this face guard as the BT-5 model. And this BT-5 model would be a game changer. And we're going to get to how it was a game changer. But first, we got to get to the bottom of this. Where did the modern face mask from that era come from? It wasn't Paul Brown, it wasn't during a game in 1953, it was in a basement in Terre Haute, Indiana, 20 years prior. In 1935, a guy named Vern McMillan, who owned a sporting goods company in downtown Terre Haute, came up with the idea of this type of facial protection that could be tacked onto a helmet. It wasn't really anything that was game-breaking or innovative, facial protection going across leather helmets that existed in some form or another, but usually it was just hard metal that was dangerous, could cut players depending on how that metal was made and pieced together or welded together. So he had this idea of coming up with a face mask that was about the same size as his smallest finger and would be coated in rubber. And so that, based on some sources that do some deeper digging, is the source of the first design of a bar face mask for the football helmet, at least in this era of time. There's an article in the Tribune Star from November 19th, 2019, talking about a new museum that's going to be in downtown Terre Haute. And it shows a picture of a guy named George Leach working on these face masks in his own basement for Vern McMillan and his company. A guy just in a basement, no facial protection, just there in a t-shirt with the fumes of this plastic or rubber coating, dipping metal masks into it to coat them long before the BT-5 came about. But to be fair, the BT-5 was just one single bar. This one has two different bars and it goes up and around the front of the helmet. But this employee that was working on dipping these masks, his name is George Leach, and even though I kind of joke about the fact that he's not wearing any sort of a mask or anything to protect him from the fumes from this type of stuff. He seems to be doing all right, at least when this article was written at age 91. But he says, quote, in the five years that we made those face guards, we made 4,500 of them in my basement, my wife and I. There's me dipping and baking them and putting them in a salt bath. I worked full time at Visqueen and made these in my basement at nights and on my days off. I had to go to Mr. McMillan and tell him it was getting too big and I couldn't handle it. End quote. So these face masks were doing quite well and business was only getting bigger and bigger. Even before plastic helmets became a common thing, face masks were becoming a common thing. 
seen all across the board. And a lot of games that I've talked about in previous episodes, we're talking about the 1940 Rose Bowl, for instance. There are players using a face mask. And all sorts of games in the NFL, in college, and even in high school, you will find players using a face mask, which most likely might be from this McMillan Sporting Goods company. Maybe even was made in that basement in Terre Haute. One good resource I found about the origins of the football face mask, at least some of the early days of it in the 1950s and 60s, comes from Burt Gambini. He was a member of the Pro Football Researchers Association, but he's also a staple at the NPR station in Buffalo and now writes at the University of Buffalo. His great article titled The Autogram Myth and the Evolution of the Face Mask can be found on the Cleveland Browns website, clevelandbrowns.com. There's some great bits of information in this article as Gambini tries to get to the bottom of the origin of the face mask and it being worn in the NFL and then becoming commonplace. And he goes beyond just Otto Graham, Paul Brown, or the Vern McMillan face mask. For instance, here's one of the spots in that article. Quote, On October 15, 1950, Pat Harder of the Chicago Cardinals slugged Lynn Ford of the Browns. Ford required surgery to repair a broken jaw and several broken teeth and was out for nine weeks, missing the remainder of the regular season and Cleveland's playoff game versus the New York Giants. The incident was vicious, a sucker punch that occurred after the play on an unsuspecting Ford. Nevertheless, Harder was not flagged. The officials did, however, call a holding penalty on Ford. NFL Commissioner Burt Bell also wired Coach Brown after the game, instructing him to have Ford forward $30 to the league as payment for a rough play fine. Paul Brown immediately defended his player, building a case that included game films and player testimony. Bell eventually withdrew the fine, but never took action against Harder. When Ford finally returned to action in the Browns' championship game victory over the Los Angeles Rams, coached by Clark Shaughnessy, The headline in the Cleveland Plain Dealer the next day read this, Star in to don mask for battle. Examination of the historical record, however, finds that Ford wasn't the only player wearing a mask in the 1950 championship game. A photograph from the game shows Otto Graham, number 60, running with the ball in a pair of black Converse Chuck Taylor high-top sneakers, but without a mask. About four yards behind, approaching from Graham's right, is number 57 for the Rams. Don Paul, he wears a mask. That another player in the game was already wearing a mask shows that Len Ford's story was newsworthy more because of his comeback than his equipment. Paul's mask, incidentally, is not Lucite, but looks like an early ancestor of today's masks. Another photo of Paul wearing a mask from 1949 shows him barreling down on the aforementioned Pat Harder of the Chicago Cardinals. A 1948 image shows a member of the Chicago Bears looking on as Jim Castiglia of the Washington Redskins appears to cross the goal line. Among the players identified in the picture is number 30, H. Allen Smith, who is wearing a face mask. Yet another picture from 1948 and showing Otto Graham was taken just as Cleveland's Edgar Jones scores the first touchdown in the All-America Football Conference Championship game against the Buffalo Bills. Behind Jones is Cleveland's Ed Ulinski wearing 36, who is also wearing a face mask. End quote. The article goes on, quote, The masks appear to be identical, which seem to disqualify the possibility that each one was personally improvised. The masks, in fact, were designed by the Schutt Company. Although Schutt didn't mass produce masks until the early 1950s, Helmet Hut, it's a website, by the way, helmethut.com, great resource if you're into helmets and haven't checked it out, HelmetHut.com indicates that it was common to experiment with equipment before beginning the regular production. According to an email response from the site's administrators, they say it's hard to field test a product if it's not on the field. So that would explain the experimentation. That might also explain the mystery from a couple episodes ago. In 1940, when Stanford was wearing a plastic helmet, or at least we believe it was a plastic helmet, and a couple of sources we found in articles written about these specific helmets led us to believe that it probably was plastic. Yet, when you look at them, they don't look like modern leather helmets, but they don't look like the Riddell plastic helmets that were on the market. What they did look like were the Wilson plastic helmets that came out in the 50s. The coach of Stanford, Clark Shaughnessy, had direct ties to George Hallis, and George Hallis had direct ties to not just the Riddell Company, but even more direct ties, maybe even financially, to the Wilson Company. 
In fact, years after the induction of the plastic helmet, Hallis and the Chicago Bears would be using Wilson helmets while the rest of the NFL was using Riddell plastic helmets. So perhaps this does solve that mystery that Stanford was using Wilson plastic helmets, prototypes being tested out and wouldn't reach the market until the 1950s. I have nothing to confirm that directly, but just based on what we just heard, that is a possibility. Okay, I digress. Furthermore, since there wasn't a great demand for face masks in the 1930s and 40s, it didn't make good business sense to tool for production when there were enough prototypes to go around. Shut Sports has a brief history on their website that in fact confirms the company produced the first football face guards in 1935. The article goes on. Shut, however, was not the first manufacturer of football face masks. Paul Brown's development of the BT-5 sometimes leads to the mistaken belief that he invented the football face mask. Brown did invent the single bar, but the city of Terre Haute, Indiana, claims to be home to the face mask's actual inventor, Vern McMillan, we just talked about, an entrepreneur and former Terre Haute mayor. Beyond references to McMillan's company, McMillan Sports, producing face masks beyond some time in the mid-1930s, which actually coincides with the advent of Schutz mask. Other details about those masks are scarce, including what they look like and who wore them, but we know what they look like. End quote. So that's the same year that Vern McMillan is making these face masks in his basement. And this article that I'm reading from also has paragraphs about Vern McMillan and him inventing it right around this time. And in fact, it goes on to say about McMillan and Brown that, quote, Again, as is the case with Paul Brown, it's more likely that McMillan, rather than inventing the face mask, invented a specific face mask. Victor Football Goods ran ads in Sporting Life touting the company's 1897 Victor face mask and head protector as having many advantages over the old style. End quote. Again, this article that I've been quoting from was written by Bert Gambini. He's a writer for the University of Buffalo and has previously worked years on air in various Western New York radio stations. And the article originally appeared in the September-October 2012 issue of the Coffin Corner, which is the official magazine of the Professional Football Researchers Association. Great work and an interesting article. You can find it uh, where I just cited, as well as the official site of the Cleveland Browns, which is clevelandbrowns.com. So the origins of the face mask are a little bit murky on specifically where they come from. So we can really only turn to when they were really, really introduced into the game. You have 1935 when Vern McMillan starts making them, and clearly it gets well known and does pretty well as they were getting a lot of orders and this poor guy in his basement dipping these things in his spare time into molten plastic or rubber was getting overworked. But then you have Paul Brown's case. And look, we're going to give Paul Brown some credit here as well as a little bit later. He is an innovator with the helmet in more than one way, but he does get his name on a patent. Alongside the technical advisor for the Riddell company, Jerry Morgan. And that was the single bar face mask, the thing that was as big as his finger, a little bit light, and would be coated in rubber and protect a player's face. A single bar going right across the face. And that BT5 model would soon be adapted and within a couple of years would catch on pretty gosh darn quickly. The entry to Otto Graham happens in 1953. Within a couple of years, lots of players in the NFL are using face masks, and it's a divided camp in that league as to whether or not those face masks should still be allowed to be in the game, and whether or not they prevent injuries or cause them. In 1955, Washington Redskins president George Preston Marshall was calling out for a ban on face masks. This was the same year that the NFL made face masks mandatory. Marshall was saying publicly the reason he thinks it should be banned is because it causes more injuries than it prevents. And he's saying this even though all but four of his 33 players wore face masks. While the Redskins president was publicly calling for this ban on face masks, somebody polled the Redskins players on whether or not they were in favor of face masks. Of the 33 players polled, 32 were in favor of face masks. Tackle Don Bowl told the papers, quote, If they took my mask away, I'd quit pro football. I broke my nose seven times in college when I didn't have a mask. End quote. In 1955, the NFL makes face masks mandatory. And the debate on whether to ban or mandate face masks was starting to heat up at both the college and the high school level. Here's an article from the Charlotte Observer in 1956 saying the Wisconsin Lodge prep grid masks, quote, 
Attention high school athletic directors. The figures are in on the Wisconsin Interscholastic Athletic Association's 1955 survey concerning the use of football face masks in high school. The study drawn up by WIAA Secretary Cliff Fagan shows that the use of face masks reduced facial, mouth, and head injuries by 61% last fall in the state of Wisconsin. The WIAA would spend $14,125 in partially subsidizing the experiment concluded that the expenditure was justified by the results. Wisconsin's plan, which was outlined in a series of observer articles urging the use of face masks by high school football players, provided a dozen state purchase masks for each two dozen bought by individual schools. Of the 15,714 boys who played football in Wisconsin last season, 8,993 57%, wore face masks. A total of 6,721 players 43%, did not wear face masks. Only 183 of the boys wearing protective face gear, less than 2% of the total, suffered face or dental injuries. Injuries were incurred by 531 boys, 5.1% of the total not wearing masks. Thus, the WIAA concluded wearing of the masks reduced the hazards a face or mouth injury by 61%. End quote. So with studies like these coming out, even though there are still people that are opposed to the masks, this is something that gets adopted. Because while we debate on whether or not it's good or bad, players are out there getting hurt and you want to protect those players. So the face mask is becoming more common and some coaches are requiring that their entire team wear them. And eventually all leagues, high school, college and pro will require some sort of face mask. So the introduction of the plastic helmet introduces a change in the way that players play, the risks they're willing to take, and the way that they are blocking and tackling. And when you combine this plastic helmet with a hard face mask that fully protects the head in a very hard and rigid way, that really changes the game. The great Bill Belichick, who's second all-time in wins in the NFL, has said, quote, for a long time, coaches at all levels taught players to tackle with their shoulders. It goes all the way back to playing the game without face masks. Guys were taught to lead with their shoulder and turn their head to the side to protect their faces. Then equipment changed and techniques changed. Players were taught to generate all their power in a straight line, both hips, both legs, that allowed you to put your face in the middle of the runner, keeping your eyes up. End quote. Belichick's quote speaks to a couple things. Number one, it speaks to the concept of this show. He's talking about how equipment changing will change the game. And that's what it does here. Right at this point of the 1950s and 1960s, when plastic helmets become commonplace and face masks become mandated, that's where we get the origin of a technique in tackling in football that is still used in the game today. It's called bite the ball. Bite the ball football, in case you don't know, is talking about the way that you should go about tackling a player who's carrying the ball. And you may have guessed it, in case you don't know, it's trying to bite the ball. When you're coming up to tackle a ball carrier, you should try and bite the ball, more or less. Ram your face, your face mask, straight at the ball within the ball carrier. This is an effective way of teaching it because, number one, it means you're not going to miss. You're cramming your head right into their midsection. You're tracking them and the ball all the way through to the point of contact. But also, your face mask or your helmet may pop that ball loose, and then you've got a fumble on the ground that you may be able to recover, and that gains a little bit of an advantage as well. And the introduction of Bite the Ball football made tackles in the game far more punishing. Used to be shoulders being driven into guys, now it's hard plastic helmets, tough face masks going right into the midsection. You've got to hold on to a ball now with that ramming into your midsection instead of someone's shoulder. So that is a big change, and it's brought about by the changes in gear. Can you imagine trying to do bite the ball football without a face mask? No, that's basically suicide. You're going to knock your teeth out, you're going to get your nose broken, you're going to get all kinds of injuries, but once the face mask comes along compensatory behavior you guys you don't have to worry as much about getting hurt in this new style of tackling and leading with the face mask and bite the ball football it came up during my conversation with matt cheney i mean if you're not looking if your eyes are not wide open coming at me you got a serious problem because mine are wide open to the very end but that 
caused a, another type of evolution in the game, and that was forcing ball carriers to get better. Because, oh, yeah. you know, when you're trying to fake a guy out, when he's bringing yeah. his head down or closing his yeah. eyes or turning away, you know, you can make that last second yeah, move you because you can see him commit. Do that. Yeah. yeah. And now they can like, see you all the way up into contact. So that yeah. forces players to get better about their fakes and be faster. And so an evolution takes place that That's that a great way. point. If I could interject there, you know, I grew up playing against the option game. So seeing a lot of shake and bake right off the line, some incredible players and talents. So you're taught, well, watch their midsection, watch their midsection. And I got my eyes wide open. He may miss me right at the last instant. Then it's going, bam, then I'll just come up with a shoulder. But most of the time, he is not going to fool me. He is not going to get his head out of mind. And I don't care how fast he is and what he's doing at the midsection. And I also know if I come in there at the right angle, he is done. He's done. And he's not going to go another inch. I'm not talking about bouncing off and letting this guy drag me. I'm saying if the first down is right here, I hit him right here. He's not going another inch. He's a foot short. That's where it's going to end. Yeah. When I have my eyes wide open, when I get right in here on him, he can weigh 50 pounds more than I. I got it. Guarantee you. Yeah. And while these changes are going on and face masks are being made mandatory, there's still a lot of debate. In 1961, it was Penn State trainer Alfred Grice who was in the papers calling for the end of face masks. It was circulated by the Associated Press, but I'm looking at an article from November 4th, 1961 in the Des Moines Tribune. But Alfred Grice, this Penn State trainer, said, quote, we have found that most team doctors feel a great need for changes in the helmets. A lot of them feel that the face guard should come off and we should make mandatory the wearing of mouthpieces, end quote. Now, the other thing that is staggering about 1961 is that 28 players died that year playing football. And Grice stated that of the seven deaths he had observed by watching game film, five of them were caused by the face mask causing the helmet to push upwards and back and into the player's spine at the base of the skull. And it wasn't just doctors and trainers speaking out, it was other influential people as well. In 1962, it was Fritz Kreisler calling for a face mask ban. You may recognize that name. He was in the first episode of How Gear Changed the Game when we were talking about the introduction of the winged helmet paint design that was at Michigan, used back when he first joined the team and is still the design of the Michigan Wolverines helmet to this very day. Chrysler was appearing in articles all across the country, saying things like, quote, The mask injures rather than protects, and that's not the object of equipment. Head and neck injuries are up 82% in the last 14 years, and the face mask is the cause of it. I'd rather see a boy of mine with a broken nose or broken teeth than on a slab in a morgue. And Chrysler at this time is also the chairman of the Football Rules Committee of the NCAA. This article that I'm reading these quotes from was from the Associated Press, came out in September of 1962, and it goes on to say, quote, He concedes there is division among the coaches, but insists a majority favor outlawing the mask and says that the Rules Committee didn't act against it at its last meeting because some members thought we would sound like alarmists. He explained his opposition to the mask coupled with a plastic helmet. And the article goes on under the headline, Head-on Blocking. Chrysler says, quote, a blow can snap it upward and pivot the back of the helmet into the back of the wearer's neck, causing serious whiplash injury. Blocking, says Chrysler, now is taught head-on. The blocker doesn't have to worry about injury and stick his head where it shouldn't be. There are spearing drills where a boy jams his head into the chest of another. There is goring where they pile head-first onto a runner who is stopped or downed. Take off the mask and you will end that. They won't go in with their heads. Michigan's coach Bump Elliott explained that his Wolverines, who came under Chrysler as athletic director, wear them to protect ourselves against other masks, end quote. Obviously, the mask never gets outlawed. In fact, it gets mandated. And so this type of tackling continues to become commonplace. And the solution to this rising issue and the concern over the deaths isn't to ban things, but it's to keep them around and just keep building up the types of padding and protection available. I should point out a rule change that exacerbated this great change with the plastic helmet and the face mask when it comes to blocking and tackling. In 1949, the NCAA instituted a rule that required blockers keep their hands against their chest. 
So you can't use your hands or arms. So when a hard plastic helmet comes along, well, that kind of equalizes that thing that you're being handicapped with since you can't use your hands. How can you effectively block? Well, at least you now have this hard helmet that'll help you a little bit more. So we know about the tendencies for players brought about by new hard plastic helmets, the face masks, we know about the criticism. Let's just go through the timeline real quick. In 1951, that's when the NCAA makes face masks legal. In 1955 is when the NFL makes face masks mandatory. There were a couple of caveats with this rule. Number one was that in 1955, even though face masks were now mandatory, they could only be a single bar. No face mask with more than a single bar was allowed, but that only lasted a year once the players got together and petitioned for them to be allowed to wear more than just a single bar as facial protection. The other caveat, individual players could petition for their right to not wear a face mask and be granted that by the NFL, and some were, including Tommy McDonald, who was the last non-kicker to play in the NFL without a face mask. I tried to find an exact date on when McDonald started wearing a face mask. It appears that he was wearing one by 1962 because there's an account in the newspaper where he was dragged down by his face mask during a play. So even though face masks were pretty much commonplace, if not mandatory, at the NFL level, the college level, and the high school level, one thing that did not exist yet was the face mask penalty. Yeah. There was a brief period in football when players were allowed to just grab another player's face mask, and that was a quick and easy way to bring down a ball carrier or somebody that isn't carrying a ball. And some players, especially at the pro level, made a pretty good career out of their ability to grab a face mask and drag a player down. And while this existed for a while and while it was really, really common and a quite useful tactic, it didn't really last long, even though there was a little bit of overlap. Because in 1955, when the NFL made face masks mandatory, well, in 1956, that's when they passed the first face mask penalty. It said that you couldn't tackle, drag down, grab, twist a player's face mask because it could cause some injury, and that would be a 15-yard penalty. But the problem is, they made it illegal to do that to any player on the field except for the ball carrier. It wasn't until 1961 that it was illegal to drag down a ball carrier by the face mask. And that rule wasn't instituted until 1962. So for eight seasons, if you were a ball carrier, you not only had to worry about getting tackled, but even if you got by a player, they could just grab your face mask and drag you down that way. And of course, as you could imagine, that caused a heck of a lot of injuries. And it's things like this that I wish the NFL were tracking tackles as a stat before 2001, officially. I mean, they started in the early 90s, but tackling as a stat wasn't officially kept until 2001. But if tackles as a stat were kept back during this time from 1955 to 1962, 63, 64... I would love to see the change in amount of tackle stats for some of these players once they weren't allowed to grab a face mask and tackle a player that way. One particular player that's pointed out as one of the sources of the face masking penalty is a guy named Night Train Lane, a guy who I am definitely going to do an episode on here in the near future because he's an interesting character and gear was a big part of his game. His Junior college in Nebraska was one of the first schools in the country to get a plastic helmet. It was Notre Dame, it was Oklahoma, and it was Scotts Bluff Junior College, where Night Train Lane went. Well, he was good at a lot of things, but one of them was using the face mask to tackle players, and they made that illegal and while making face masking illegal may have affected some players and their ability to be dominant in the game, but Night Train Lane was just too gosh darn good at too many things. Again, gotta do an episode on him here soon. At the college level, well, they got on it pretty early, and that's thanks to the guy that we heard about earlier, Fritz Chrysler. You know, he was an extreme critic of face masks and the injuries that they caused, and he got on top of that right away as the rules committee chair. In 1957, the NCAA banned face masking across the board for any player. If you grabbed a player's face mask intentionally to bring them down, to change their direction, to do anything really, it was a 15-yard penalty. So the face masking penalties got put in place after a brief golden era of being able to use them. 
and by 1960, the National Alliance Football Rules Committee voted to make face masks mandatory in high school football. So by the time we get into the 60s, face masks are being used just about everywhere. But that wouldn't put an end to the criticism. Critics would speak up and are still speaking up. Even in 2008, Mike Dicka was talking about how if you got rid of face masks, you could produce a lot of these hits to the head that people are so worried about. And beginning in the 1960s, we went from single bar to multi-bar face masks to an expansion of all kinds of different designs in the face mask. Every position has their own unique style. Like the players that play on the line of scrimmage have a face mask that is bigger and goes lower to protect the throat and the jaw. Kickers obviously have a less restrictive, less visible type of face mask, and quarterbacks do as well. There's visors, there's different crossbar patterns, all different types of face masks that are now in the game today. Even though sometimes when they get out of hand as recently as they did around 2010, some regulations from the NFL gets passed down and some types of face masks get banned. But either way, throughout this episode, the goal has been to talk about the plastic helmet and how its combination with the face mask and the face mask coming along truly changing the way that the game is played because it changed the way that players block and tackle. And just that simple change in blocking and tackling has a massive change in the game because a big part of the game is blocking and tackling. Vince Lombardi himself said, quote, Football is two things. It's blocking and tackling, end quote. So when that big portion of the game is changed, well, that's a big piece of gear changing a big piece of the game. And to drive it all home, I really wanted to just flat out ask this question when I was talking with Matt Cheney. Did, uh, did plastic helmets change tackling? Oh, I undoubtedly. The evolution of helmets, which is clearly available in video, and how it relates to what I've been talking about, the narrowing of contact from shoulders down to the point where you are right, full blast, zero contact in on people, especially once they got the great face masks, not these stupid little single bar things, but they got cage face masks that were firm and did not collapse either. So you had the problem early on of both technologies, collapsing plastic helmets and collapsing face masks. And they worked that all out by the late 50s pretty well. And then by 1970, it was done. How did that change tackling? Well, it made it extremely, seemingly easy on the part of the player to ram your face through anybody. And objects, as I said, you, you'll test it out. You'll test it out on a wall. You'll maybe be down in the stadium restroom on Saturday before the game and Bam! You know, you're going to take out that tile dispenser or something. Man, I mean, you are a smart bomb. And I, and I want to make this point. Current lawsuits and recently resolved, settled lawsuits against football, whether at the uh, youth, college, or pro level, they're coming down often to how the evolution of helmets basically has channeled and really captured players now. You have no other choice but to use your head. Are you your second, third, and fourth in those football collisions? But it, it's the nature of the beast. It's athleticism in the face of annihilation. You know, it all goes into this, and, man, you got that helmet out there. You somehow think you're not going to face these consequences long term. And, unfortunately, real bad things happen. That was author Matt Cheney, who has done a lot of great writing and research when it comes to sports and its history, health issues, and consequences. He's written numerous articles, a couple of books, including Spiral of Denial, Muscle Doping in American Football, and you can find out more about what he does and read some of his writings at fourwallspublishing.com. The plastic helmet and the addition of a face mask is not just something used for injured players, but something used by every player in multiple forms, in multiple ways, had an impact on the game, on the way it was played, and on the rules, regulations, types of play calls, types of tackling, everything. The evolution of football took on a new direction. And now players had new capabilities. Coaches had new plays, new styles that they could now implement thanks to this evolution and this piece of equipment, these pieces of equipment, the plastic helmet and the face mask. 
and we learned a little bit about it in this episode, but as always, there's plenty more to explore when it comes to the helmet and when it comes to the face mask, and I encourage you, if you found this stuff interesting, to do a deep dive yourself and try and find out more about how gear changed the game. I've been your host, Alex Kindig Sherman. I'm the executive producer, the editor, the researcher, and the auto mechanic of How Gear Changed the Game. I take a lot of pride in what I do here. I'm trying to give you as much information as I can because I know when you listen to this, you're giving me the most valuable thing you have, your time, and I want to make it worth your time. If you enjoyed what you heard in this episode and previous episodes, please, if you could, just take a moment to subscribe to the podcast. It does a lot more good for us than you realize, and you get notified when we post a new episode. And there's a lot of episodes coming up. We're not just covering football or the helmet. We're covering all pieces of gear in all kinds of sports, and we're just getting started. So I hope you will take a moment right now even. Maybe right now? Can you get your phone? Can you hit subscribe? And just thinking about it. But if you can, please subscribe and rate the show. If you want to leave us a friendly comment, maybe some nice words, suggestions for future episodes, you can reach us at HowGearChangeTheGame at gmail.com. Thanks to Matt Cheney for joining the episode and providing his insight. He is a great person who has done a great deal of research. I always enjoy talking to him. We've had some great conversations, and you can find out more about his research, about the work that he's done at FourWallsPublishing.com. If you enjoy football history, football health, or some of the details and things, you'll probably like what he has written there. Understand that when it comes to football, injuries, contact, use of equipment, it's a politically charged subject. And I just want to make it very clear, I'm not trying to get politically involved in anything. I'm simply trying to tell the story of the evolution of a sport that is caused by the evolution of sports equipment. It's a fascinating thing to me, the evolution of sports. And I'm a gear nerd, so... I like the gear, but please just know that I am not trying to be political. I'm not trying to sway one way or another. I'm trying to stay neutral while telling the story of the gear and the change within the game. And to simply share some things I found during my research that was really interesting. So I hope you found it interesting too. I've got more interesting things coming up about the evolution of the football helmet and the game of football. I've got great interviews, including an interview with Bob Romanski, the second generation equipment manager of the Raiders coming up here soon. So I hope you'll keep coming back, keep downloading, stay subscribed as we learn more about how gear changed the game.